Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy and in today's video tutorial we're going to spend some more time looking at polymers. We're going to begin by looking at how polymers are named and then we're going to look at how polymers can be classified into different groups. So on the left hand side of the screen here we have what's called a monomer and mono means one. And a monomer is basically a single repeating unit. So on the left hand side we see the monomer and on the right hand side we see the polymer. Poly means many, so in effect many monomers are joined together to form a polymer. Now the length of these polymer chains can vary from being very short to very long continuous chains and when we have these long single chains this is called the backbone of the polymer. So in here the carbon atoms form the backbone. Now this particular polymer that's drawn here is called polyethylene and it consists entirely of carbon and hydrogens and in fact the formula for the monomer on the left hand side would just be C2H4 and we would see that repeat throughout the chain. In effect for every carbon we have two hydrogens providing that's a continuous chain. So now let's look at a slightly different polymer that you may have heard of. So in the monomer for this particular polymer, we see that one of the hydrogens has been replaced by a chlorine atom. So our formula becomes C2H3Cl. And on the right hand side, we see the polymer that forms when these monomers join. And this particular polymer is called polyvinyl chloride, more commonly known as PVC. So once again, we see the repeating units, except this time, we see a chlorine atom attached to every alternative carbon atom. So that's PVC, polyvinyl chloride. Let's look at a slightly different variation. Okay, so this time on the monomer, we see that all of the hydrogens have been replaced by fluorine atoms. So we have the formula C2F4. If we look at the polymer on the right hand side, we see every carbon atom joined to two other carbon atoms forming the backbone and then also joined to two fluorine atoms. The name of this polymer is slightly longer, polytetrafluoroethylene. But where this comes from, poly means many, tetra means four, fluoro stands for fluorine and again we have ethylene, polytetrafluoroethylene. We'll just take a look at a couple more. So this particular polymer has a lot in common with polyethylene, except this time we see that one of the hydrogens has been replaced with a CH3 group. And a CH3 group would look something like this. So in effect, we end up with a polymer with a small branch coming off of the backbone. Therefore, the formula for this monomer would be C. 3H6. Now this particular polymer on the right hand side is called polypropylene and what we see is branches of CH3 attached to alternating carbon atoms like so. So again a slight variation on polyethylene with a CH group attached to alternative carbons and this one's called polypropylene. We'll just look at one more that you've probably heard of, polystyrene. Okay, so this one requires a small amount of explanation because we have a new group attached to our backbone and in the bottom left hand corner we see the symbol used to represent this particular group. Now this group is called a benzene ring and in the bottom right hand corner we see what that symbol there represents. And what we see is six carbons forming a ring and we have alternating single and double bonds between those carbons. So we have a carbon to carbon double bond here then we have a carbon to carbon single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, forming the benzene ring or the basis for the benzene ring. But recall that in order for a carbon to be stable, it needs to have four pairs of shared electrons in order to create that complete outer shell. So what we see in addition is each carbon in the benzene ring is also attached to a hydrogen. That is with the exception of the carbon at the top because the carbon at the top is attached to the backbone of the polymer here. 
So the carbon at the top doesn't have a hydrogen attached, but it attaches to the carbon backbone. Therefore, the formula for this benzene ring, we have six carbons, C6, and we have five hydrogens. So C6H5. So now let's relate that back to the formula for our monomer. Well, in total, we can see here that we have six carbons in our benzene ring and two on the backbone, giving us C8. And we have five hydrogens in the benzene ring, plus an additional three attached to the carbons of the backbone, giving us H8. So C8H8 is the formula for the monomer. On the right hand side, we see the polymer. And this polymer here is called polystyrene, which you've probably heard of. And we see benzene groups or benzene rings attached to alternating carbons on that backbone. Now what we've seen here is just a very small fraction of the polymers that are used. But the important thing to realise is that polymers are very versatile. We can create all sorts of different combinations, but we can also influence how those polymers stack together, which is what we're going to move on to now. OK, so I'm just going to use this slide to explain a few concepts. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is the difference between crystalline and amorphous polymers. The first thing that I want to point out is that this isn't a clearly defined distinction because most polymers will actually be semi-crystalline, meaning they have regions which are crystalline and regions which are amorphous. If you recall from earlier tutorials, crystalline means neatly packed, whereas amorphous means irregular. If we were to look at the two extremes, an amorphous polymer, the chains, would have no regular structure. So we would have the polymer chains and there would be no regular structure to those. If by the other extreme we looked at crystalline polymers, all of the polymer chains would be neatly arranged like so. But in reality, we get a combination of the two happening in polymers. So what we end up with is regions where the polymer is crystalline and we end up with neatly stacked layers like so. And then we may have an amorphous region. And then we may have a crystalline region. And this can continue throughout the polymer. And the degrees of crystallinity can vary greatly. We also have ways of influencing this. And we'll see how this impacts on the properties of polymers later on. Our next classifications are linear, branched and cross-linked polymers. And linear polymers are what we saw in the case of polyethylene, where we have neat linear molecules. We saw an instance of a branched polymer in polypropylene, where we had branches of CH3 coming off of those polymer chains. And those branches can vary in quantity and also vary in length. Now finally, we have cross-linked polymers. And in a cross-linked polymer, we have polymer chains. And what we actually have is solid covalent bonding between those links, like so. So instead of intermolecular bonds, as we would see in the case of our linear polymers, we would have intermolecular bonds between the layers. Or between the molecules, like so. Over here, what we're looking at is covalent bonds. So we end up with very strongly bound networks of polymer chains. Now this also relates to the final classification for polymers. All polymers can be separated into two groups. They're either considered to be thermoplastic or thermosetting plastic, also referred to as thermosets. Thermoplastics can be moulded to form a shape, but then when heat's applied, they will remelt. So typically our thermoplastics can be recycled because even though they've been formed into a shape, they can be heated and melted and then formed into a new shape. Thermosets or thermosetting plastics are different. Once they've been chemically bound and chemically bonded, we end up with very complex cross-linked networks. Quite often, the entire polymer will just be one large molecule, and applying heat to those won't melt the polymer. Instead, what will happen is that it will burn and char. So thermosets, once bound or once formed, can no longer be melted and reshaped, they can no longer be reused. In the next video, we're going to look at the process of polymerization.
which is where we go from our monomers to our polymers. And we'll also look at some of the different ways we can influence the type of polymers that result from that process.